Welcome to the Disruptive Social Care Podcast with social care provocateur and social media queen Shirley Ayers and myself, Stuart Arnott, founder of Mindings, a service dedicated to bringing social media to the disconnected. In this fortnightly show, we aim to spread the word about what's going on in the world of disruptive social care, amplify the voices of people with great ideas that few people ever hear about, and to help our communities connect and collaborate. Well, Shirley, hello. Hi, Stu. Show number five. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm suffering from Olympics withdrawal. <laughs> well, I mean, it was a fabulous festival, wasn't it? A real feel-good factor for for the whole country. That was great. Um, and very much now looking forward to the Paralympics. Oh, absolutely. So I can have my evening fill of athletics and emotional outpouring. <laughs> Do you know, I, I, I suddenly I've become an expert on all these very, very obscure sports that two weeks ago I knew nothing about. We get that, of course, being Scottish every now and again. All of a sudden, everybody in Scotland is a big curling fan. Oh. And like they've never watched a curling match in their life. And now I've, uh, I feel like I'm an expert on on um, rhythmic gymnastics and well, <laughs> high I'm, diving. And well, stuff. the high diving, yes. You know, the sort of, don't make a splash as you go in there, Tom. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm watching this person doing what appears to be like a perfect dive. And I'm going, that was rubbish. Yep. <laughs> like I was an expert. <laughs> anyway, it's been really good fun. Some of our viewers, as opposed to our listeners, noticed that last week's show was a bit more televisual than normal. Well, we brought in a cameraman and some proper broadcast kit as an experiment. So do you think anyone noticed? Uh, I think they did. And what I was very interested in, I, I've spoken to a couple of listeners um, about the podcasts. And they were saying, as visual people, they really like watching our web webcams because they find it an easy way of... Um, absorbing, you know, all the information and our comments and the debates. And the other comment was that they wish our format was adopted by many of the social care organisations who still have to learn that um, you can provide interesting information through podcasts, through videos. Uh, and so if anybody out there would like our expertise on delivering your communications in a more interesting format do get in touch i'm not actually going to name the organizations who got the thumbs down for the way that they're using video and social media channels at the moment <laughs> excellent well certainly um we'd be very interested in talking to anybody last week's show so that was show number four if you want to check that on our youtube channel as i say we brought in some good camera equipment so you can uh, you can see an example of um what what we can do with a little bit of a budget obviously we, we self-fund this show um, so on, on the other point, if anybody's interested in sponsoring, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. So Shirley, what's been happening this week in the world of social care? Well, one of the significant um, things for me was following the uh, broadcast of the BBC Panorama, Undercover Care, the Abused Exposed programme in May 2011, which showed Winterbourne View staff mistreating and abusing adults with learning disabilities and autism. And South Gloucestershire's Adult Safeguarding Board commissioned a serious case review, <clears throat> which was published recently. And this is a horrifying catalogue of institutional abuse and the failure of organisations charged with the responsibility of protecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And I think all of the organisations, and there were a lot who were involved, need to seriously consider the recommendations and the conclusions. Because, you know, the, a few things about it. The origins of Winterfell, Winterbourne View Hospital were not based on a local population needs assessment. Uh, you have a private company, Castle Beck, who spotted a business opportunity and this wasn't discouraged by NHS commissioners. They'd indicated their willingness to buy its services irrespective of national policy and guidance. And the review confirms that the way of oversight across sectors was not equal to the task of uncovering the facts and extent of abuses and crimes, and that's what they were, crimes, at the hospital. And this included ignoring staff who had reported their concerns to the Care Quality Commission. You know, we know that people in residential care can be vulnerable and isolated, and we as a society have to protect them in the best way that we can. And there have been a lot of excellent um, blogs about the issues raised by the Winterbourne Review and we will be including links on the website. Absolutely. If you go to disruptivesocialcare.com, we put uh, extensive show notes there with um, all the links to everything that's in the show. Indeed. 
Um, another interesting publication was the review of the national arrangements for providing information and advice to carers. Now, you know, this is a big issue across social care generally. How do people access good information, advice and support? And this is particularly important for carers who may be quite isolated. So they do need um, help in maintaining and supporting them in their caring role. Now, interestingly, Carers Direct pri provides an online information point for carers, um, which is part of NHS Choices, and a telephone advice line through which they can gain access to individual and more personal advice. So I was interested to see that the costs for the Carers Direct website last year were around 300000 and the costs for the telephone helpline service totaled $1.6 million. Now, whilst carers seem very happy with the advice provided, there is an issue that, you know, people will be referred to local carer services and some of them are experiencing very serious cuts. And, you know, as Chorfrost Carers said to me on Twitter, you know, they need um, a relatively small sum of money to keep going every year and they're struggling and many local carers' organisations are struggling. So it's interesting to reflect on could that 1.6 million be spent in different ways? Um, and I'd like to give a mention because, you know, we, 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 we talk about a lot of things to do with shining a light on innovation. And the Young Rewired State Festival of Code had over 400 young coders between the ages of 8 and 18 in 40 centres across the UK developing websites and apps together. I just think this is such an amazing idea. And it offers a space for youngsters to come together, think up an idea for a web or a mobile app, and then work to make the, that, that idea a reality. So credit for pulling this together to Emmy, Emma Mulqueeny, also known as At Hub Mum. And there's a lovely video from Tiffany St. James, which is talking about how we empower young hackers and coders. Oh, I've got a big... Cheshire grin, cat smile on my face. I, I loved hearing about this, because uh, it's not. You could understand. I was one of these kids <laughs> who I was sitting in my bedroom with my Sinclair Spectrum, uh, and I had lots of geeky friends. And and this is exactly the kind of thing that mm. that, that we did actually, making little Space Invader type programs and stuff like that. We loved it, and I was shocked when I learned. Genuinely shocked recently when I learned that computer studies at schools had turned into how to use Microsoft Word. Yeah, uh, instead of actual coding, so it was uh, it was great to hear about this. And there's a really good interview with Emma Mulqueeny talking about Young Rewired Stay on this week's uh, Guardian Tech Weekly podcast. I'll put a URL um, on the show notes for that. Um, but thrilled to hear about that. Excellent. And um, and I'm just a sort of final mention that disruptive social care got a mention on the Huffington Post this week because I'm supporting a lovely initiative called Young Women of Business, which is offering a young woman in Powers, Wales, um, who's at the start of their career, the opportunity to be mentored and supported by a lovely lady called Annette Burgess, an experienced entrepreneur who wants to give something back. And as I said to her, wouldn't it be great if that was available in every local authority in the UK? We had a whole host of entrepreneurs to mentor and support young people, whether it's sort of getting into employment or actually starting their own businesses. So, um, so as you know, I, I, I mean, I think overall, when I was talking to Annette, one of the observations she made is that, you know, although um, I, I'm primarily known for promoting social media for social good, uh, what we're committed to is actually promoting ways of enabling people to live more fulfilling lives. And so that probably needs a broader definition of social care. Absolutely. So good on Annette. And again, links to everything we've uh, spoken about there on uh, disruptivesocialcare.com. Now, normally at this point in the show, we'd have a guest, but I had such an amazing experience at the Olympics Park last week. I went with my wife and my four-year-old daughter and it was mostly because of the volunteers. I thought they were amazing. It really did. I it was it was such a happy place, and there was so many people who are positive and motivated and helpful and cheery. It, it was it was a revelation, and uh, and that was because of the volunteers. And there's been a lot of talk about volunteering as a result. So I thought that we should talk about some of the amazing innovation that's going on in giving and in volunteering. Uh, we've touched on it in previous weeks, but I thought it worthwhile actually doing a section on it. 
I, I just before we go on to that, I'd, I'd like to say I really enjoyed seeing the photos of you and your family <laughs> at the Olympic <laughs> Park. And it occurred to me, obviously, that you would be sharing them with your dad through mindings. That was what I was doing. I was posting them. I was sending them, some of them direct, and I was putting them onto his mining screen. It was great because it, it meant that that evening I was able to phone him up. And, we were, you know, he kind of shared in that experience of um, of us being at the Olympics. And, and again, it's something I say, it gave him something to talk to my daughter, CJ, about. Because yeah. he was able to yeah. say, oh, did you go up the big tower? And her face, how did you know? Kind of thing. And, and it, yes. you know, it's great. So it's, it's caused that, that better connection. So, yeah, that's, that's why I was doing it. So if you've seen <laughs> him on Facebook, that was because pictures that I post on Feedbook can be fed straight into mindings. Well, I, I just thought that was lovely, you know, and, and, and that, <clears throat> that I think has been one of the key things about the Olympics is a society sharing and how we use technology to help people share more. And one of the, one of the interesting facts is that uh, over 4 million people applied to be games makers and 70,000 were um, <clears throat> selected and what a difference they made. And so... I, I was then thinking, and it was a question I asked on Twitter recently, if you want to give time, money or resources, where do you find the information? And how can we make it easier for people to give? Do we need a roadmap which helps people access opportunities for volunteering? And, a, you know, a good response from, from um, Dan Such, do you start from I want to give or start with a cause stroke end in mind? And I agree that different starting points mean different routes. There was also a comment from Alistair Somerville um, at Acuity Design asking, is this a communications issue or is this just an unfocused desire to help? And there is a great article written by Dan Such about how charities are using digital technology to solve problems and a very interesting suggestion that charities should do a lot more partnering with experts in digital technology and social media. And I'd go one stage further and say that all organisations delivering publicly funded services should have a clear strategy for embedding innovations in their organisations and be actively working to identify and overcome the barriers which are stopping this happening at the moment. You know, web technologies have enabled communities to share information, advice and support. And they're increasing neighbourhood social capital and developing new networks. And so if you are an organisation that is not involved with that, you are missing out on so much innovation. It's happening out with your organisation. How can you bring it into the core of your organisation and respond differently to what people's needs and desires are? I often get asked when I'm doing presentations, um, what, is, what is our IP of mindings? And I say our IP is our innovation. I think that's the biggest asset we've got is our innovation. It's our roadmap of new ideas that we have that we're going to be integrating into mining. And it's also the community of people who are contributing ideas yeah. towards us helping building. So innovation is absolutely at the core of what we're doing. Um, there are so many ways in which people can donate their time, their money and resources, Shirley. Um, and technology through social networks is playing a big role, making it increasingly easy for people to volunteer online and for people to reach out and say that they need volunteers. I'd like to highlight um, Spots of Time, which um, has a mission to make it easier for people to put their spare spots of time to good use in their communities by creating sort of small activities for people to do. And they work with voluntary and community groups to help them to offer these activities. So, for example, if a residential home wanted help in compiling a CD of 1940s music for a reminiscence group, they could put that on spots of time. And so someone who wouldn't maybe be able to make a regular commitment could say, yes, I can, I can put together a CD for you. So, I mean, practical, easy to do, technology enabled. And um, uh, on, a, on a community level, the Haringey Neighbourhood Connect which aims to improve the quality of life of older people by supporting them to live independently in their communities and encourages older people to contribute their skills and experience to their community as well as receiving support. So it's much more of a reciprocal relationship. And it is interesting to explore how the big funders are supporting social innovation. And as part of the Cabinet Office-funded Innovation and Giving Fund, 
Recently, Nesta has selected 28 medium to large scale charities to participate in its Open Innovation Programme, which is about helping charities to take innovative approaches um, to giving um, and scale them up, because that is an issue. How do you go from a very small enterprise to something that potentially has national or even international benefits? And, you know, that's something, I mean, Mindings is working with because of the work that, for example, you're doing in Australia. You know, it, it's a constant challenge about scalability and which organisations should be supported who will be able to deliver on that scalability. That, that's something that Nesta have been doing with the Dallas programme, the Delivering ass I, Assisted yep. Living, and that they've been interested in... in um, essential living technologies, but, but how you scale them up? Yes, that's what they're interested in. So it's, it's been it's been too late on for us, but certainly something we're looking at. Well, like, you know, I, I I think it is you know clearly what is needed is much more collaboration between frontline charities, developers, innovat innovators, um, and you know to 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 get lots more information into organisations. Disruptive social care in action, I think. Um, and as part of that sort of innovation in, in um, giving program, I'd like to give a special mention to Hashtag We Will Gather, which has been set up by Dan Thompson, um, once again, which aims to help people give small amounts of time for community projects. Now, Dan used social media to mobilise thousands of people to clean up their communities after the 2011 riots using the hashtag Riot Cleanup. That was brilliant. It was, wasn't it? You know, I mean, the, the, the power of, of people to give for good. Um, and we will gather, we'll be using Twitter to source large numbers of volunteers to perform community tasks such as clearing allotments, litter picks, cleaning up after flood damage. And all you have to do is tweet the hashtag we will gather, uh, a postcode and the word help to get started, which sends a message to the we will gather website, which will then be in contact. Now, the site has gone live to coincide with the first anniversary of the riots, but will officially launch on the 11th of September. So, social media in action. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Do you think? It's, it's lovely, lovely. So, so, there's, you know, so, so the fact is there's a hell of a lot of stuff being, being supported by organisations. Um, and I suppose when I see one of, our, one of our roles is to shine a light on all of these innovations, because I also think it's worth looking at and the projects that are being supported by the Nominate Trust. And they've got a new social networking platform which aims to encourage people to get to know their neighbours and um, engender a spirit of, you know, sort of community togetherness. And they're also supporting another programme called Coming Alive, which is exploring how technology can be used to stimulate um, conversations about past experiences and interests and improve the emotional well-being for people in residential care homes. And they're going to be using iPads, the internet, video projector um, to help people um, with their reminiscence, really, um, and enable people to share their most important memories. So, you know, and, and there's a whole range of innovative programmes there. And we've now, you know, or to another one, we have the Independence Matters programme, which is run by the Design Council and the Technology Strategy Board. Now, they're supporting seven projects which are supporting independence, choice and autonomy for older people. Um, we've already mentioned casserole and obviously we had Mertz on talking about what they're doing which is you know a pretty unique food sharing network which is bringing communities together around around home cooked food um, we've also they're also supporting the League of Mills which helps people to cook better and waste less by by sharing older adults knowledge and tips about ho home cooking uh, and in collaborative cooking sessions um, we've got Gusto, which is a self-help cooperative where members can do more of the things they love, try new experiences and meet new people. Um, Room for Tea, a home sharing network which connects guests in need of short-term affordable accommodation with hosts who have spare capacity in their homes. I know. love that. Uh, 
Um, I've got a spare room. Maybe. <laughs> we can <Yeah>. do. <laughs> but you know, all, all being done, you know, all sort of through through technology, which is you know what I think is fascinating. You know, and of particular interest. You know, if you're an older person living alone, that um, you could have a sort of checked and approved intern or young person living with you, and not only supporting with everyday tasks, but also introducing you, for example, to the delights of the internet. Um, and so. You know, all of these are such, you know, they're using technology to, to start building relationships. And one of my favourites, The Amazings, which takes the life experience of, of passionate older adults and turns it into unique experiences that people can be part of. And, you know, it's also an income generating um, uh, uh, scheme, but you know, if you look on the Amazing's website, you know, you've got everything from foraging in Hackney through to learning about um, about uh, about photography or hairdressing. You know, I, I'm fabulous. Really love it as an idea. And great name, great name as well. Yes, amazing. it is. It That's is. Really cool. It is. Uh, you know, lovely project. I'm looking forward to that rolling out right across the country. Um, you know, I think. Some, currently in London, but I think it has potential. And Meet to Eat, which is a regional service for older adults that teaches a range of domestic nutrition and kitchen basics to those who need it most, you know, and, 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 uh, in a social setting. So once again, that sort of that food sharing, that social element. And, and another one that, you know, I'm much taken with because, you know, isolation and loneliness are a serious problem for older people. And it can affect not just their mental, but their physical well-being. And so I was particularly interested to read about the After Work Club, a new social network for men who don't want to be retired, which aims to inspire and connect people to, to, to do different things, uh, you know, at a, at a transitional time of their lives. So, you know, the, this is just a snapshot of the range of innovative programs. I mean, you mentioned the Dallas program. Um, and, and in fact, there's probably about four or five other programs, you know, about dementia, living well, um, living independently. And I, I think the real issue for me is that unless people are aware of the potential, what's on offer, it's very hard to say, I think this would really add value to my life. So I think all of these organisations, you know, and there's about seven or eight big funders in the field, need to think quite seriously about how they're going to coordinate the information and start promoting it much more effectively to a very fragmented sector. But there's a lot of people, I think, who'd be really interested in these projects that are at the moment very small scale. And we've got to work together to work out how we can roll them out across the country. That's right. Um, um there's some fantastic ideas there. I, I loved hearing about all these. The After Work Club is one that particularly touches me. My my dad, you know, working, he, he lives at home alone, uh, ex-car mechanic, so he used to do stuff with his hands all the time. And uh, I think at that age, when you're living alone, losing your sense of purpose, yes. I think, is, is yes. such a major, major, a major thing. And, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any way I can integrate any of this stuff in with mind things. I mean, it's given me an awful lot to think about. Well, you, you know, from, from my research, I'd, I'd say there's probably about 100 potential projects. And I, I, I think when I have a bit of time, I'm actually going to think about the ones that could be implemented very easily by a local authority. So they're not going to require a lot of funding. But what they will require is a local authority to say, you know, our services being delivered at the moment um, aren't as good as they they could be what can we adopt how can we consult with local people and say look there's all of these exciting things which ones should we be supporting yep and there are a lot of people out there who would gladly muck in and help absolutely yes so. yes so so i mean you know that that sort of innovation and giving is slightly slightly sort of veered off the point but i think it's you know two things for me i, I mean there are many opportunities for people to volunteer and volunteer not just money you know, but also time and resources. 
And we have to make it easier for people to be able to do that. But I think there's a separate issue about saying for older people, we don't write them off. They are just the recipients of services. They actually have valuable life skills and experiences. And we have to make it more more acceptable for people of any age to be able to 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 sort of give of their time, you know, sort of knowledge and experiences. Great. Well, um, show notes, disruptorsocialcare.com. Uh, we'll put connections to all of these people we've been discussing. Please do check them out. Follow them on Twitter uh, and help them. I think there's some great ideas that, that need rolling out around the country. This section of the programme is called Follow Friday because the show goes out on a Friday and it's a day that traditionally people use the hashtag FF Follow Friday to recommend people to their communities that they should be following. So, Shirley, what have we got this week? Well, I, I'd like to, like to sort of start off by saying that um, there every week there are some great posts written about using social media effectively. And we mustn't forget that thousands of people are signing up to social media that have no previous experience. And so I um, think we should start highlighting some of these really good um, posts, information resources. Um, and one of the things that you know, intrigues me, I, I mean, I've now been using social media, I guess, for about three years, is that a continuing hot topic of, of, of debate is about how public sector bodies are increasingly using social media to promote their services, but they're still blocking their staff from accessing social media in the workplace. Um, a real dissonance there. Uh, and people say, oh, well, we've still got to make the business case for why we use social media. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I, I nod my head sometimes with despair as well. Oh, they're just going to use it to talk to their mates. So, OK, we'll take their phones off them and take their pens away from them, take their computer <laughs> keyboards away from them. This, so, you know, it was interesting to, to, to read um, a, a report published by the National Health Service Confederation recently about current use, current use, future trends and opportunities in public sector social media. And in a nutshell, there's a real need for good leadership uh, in public sector organisation. For example, is the chief exec um, using social media? I bet they aren't. Uh, an increase, interesting, an increasing, increasing number are, um, um, and the need to trust your staff, um, and provide people, you know, make people confident about using social media, um, and we have some really good examples. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of you know using Follow Friday a bit to promote the good examples that we've got, um, but I think you know when sort of public sector organisations are, are, are thinking about, you know, using social media. We do need to be aware that the speed of Twitter is both an opportunity and a risk for organisations. You know, being able to break news quickly can be really significant, but being on the receiving end of breaking news on Twitter can represent a serious <laughs> burden and a challenge, you know, especially if you're just broadcasting. Yes. You're not actually wanting to talk to people, debate the issues and address them. Um, so, you know, worth a read, that report. And um, another, what, you know, the reason I'm constantly reminded is people are finding their way in using social media is that when I put out information about using Twitter, it tends to be one of the most retweeted <laughs> things every week mm -hmm. on, on, on sort of view. So, and so I, I put one out recently, which was a very interesting post about five reasons people unfollow you on Twitter. And there's six. <laughs> Well, I think there's more than, you know. But, but, but I was just, you know, sort of un unpacking these because people can get a bit obsessed about follower numbers. You know, it's, like, you know, it's, a, it's not a popularity contest. Better to have 100 people who you're engaging with than thousands of people who you, know, you have no meaningful engagement with. Um, so, reasons people get unfollowed. Every tweet is about your product or service. Yep. We're pretty boring. Um your tweets aren't in English now, and that is a difficulty because, you know, I get followed internationally, but if I can't understand what someone is saying in a tweet, I'm not going to retweet. I, I, you know, I read everything before I retweet it because, you know, it reflects on me as well. So that could put people off. Um, your tweets are in English, but um, 
but they can't be understood because you're using too many hashtags. Yeah, it looks like an error message. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think, you know, you don't have that many characters. And the trouble is if you have, uh, you know, a, a tweet that comprises mainly of hashtags, it is incomprehensible. Um, all your tweets are conversations. Um, it's always useful to share generously with useful content. I think that's appreciated. And your list, your tweets are all lists of names. And, and it's something I, I personally try and avoid. You know, there is, there is um, an automated service called Follow Friday. Um, but the problem is if someone just puts out a list of 10 names um, via Follow Friday Helper, it gives me no indication of why I should be following them. And um, a discussion I've had recently <laughs> on Twitter is about people who send automated thanks for following I on a direct this. message and then ask me to like their Facebook page. I hate it. No, it's I, just it, not. It, it does not reflect well. And, and in fact, when I put a tweet out about it to check whether it was just me who felt like this after a spate of receiving these automated DMs, a lot of people said to me, no, they hate it too. There are people, and I won't name them, who uh, we have uh, name-checked on the show and I have sent out follow Fridays and I have had these responses back and it's not made me very happy. No, no. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, please, please, please do stop <laughs> sending out automated DMs of <laughs> thanks. It's not doing you any good at all. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking also, social media is a great leveller and it provides a voice for everyone. You know, whether you're one person with a passion for social justice or an organisation concerned about your reputation management. And I'm delighted to see an increasing number of people who are campaigning using social media. So my Follow Fridays this week are firstly for At Lisa Says. Now, Lisa Rodriguez is the chief executive of the Sussex Partnership Foundation Trust, uh, one, of the, one of the tweeting chief execs. And she wrote an excellent social media for NHS Dummies post um, with top tips which included be yourself but never post <laughs> under the influence. That's excellent. I read that last night. It's a really good... <laughs> <laughs> really good document. I totally recommend that. Yeah, there's actually no. I think it was it Google were introducing a function that if you tried to send an email late at night, it would actually put it like in a holding pen and wouldn't send it to the next morning. Effectively, it'd say to the next morning, "You wrote this last night. I want to make sure you really wanted to send this." <laughs> we need something like that for Twitter, maybe. Mm. Well, no, of course, you know, late night tweets can be very revealing. <laughs> <laughs> And, and um, at Salma Patel, who writes about healthcare technology, engagement, social media. And she wrote a post recently about, I'm an academic and desperately need an online presence. Where do I start? A really clear introduction to using social media, um, which is relevant to most people starting off. Um, so highly recommended. And um, at KF Sheldon, who has been in the news recently. Um, now, a Care Quality Commission board member who spoke out at the public inquiry into the scandal at Mid Staffordshire Hospital last November, and she really does know what it is like to be a whistleblower exposing the failures of care systems which are meant to protect people. Um, and a follow Friday to at Norms. Now, Norman McNamara um, was diagnosed with dementia four years ago. And he uses social media to discuss the impact of dementia on his family and his life. And he's produced a very moving video about end-of-life care. And I'd also like to mention at Tommy on N Tour. And Thomas Whitelaw is a full-time carer for his mum, Joan, who has vascular dementia. And he's campaigning to improve dementia support services. Very, very moving. And finally, um, at Nurse Maiden, and Sally is a nurse who is passionate about Alzheimer's and improving the care and resources available to her dad and to others in a similar, in a similar situation and highlighting what the problems are with the system and discussing with people how we can improve things. So those would be my follow Fridays. Any, any from you? Um, I'm not going to name them, but there are a couple of people who I've connected to through the show who have actually been helping us this week were um, improving the calendaring function on Mindings. I want to make it more useful. And we've now, 
but we're literally building it this week, is a really powerful um, shared calendar that multiple people can use and set all mm-hmm. manner of appointments and things and, and it's a much better, much clearer uh, layout for the diary that we're using and there's a couple of people and you know who you are because you're listening um, who have been helping us uh, develop it and they, they spoke to us about their experience of using it, what they use it for and how we could make it really useful for them and uh, so I'm not going to name check them but they are people who as a result of um, of the show and of Follow Friday and people like that who have, who have reached out to us and um, I'm very grateful to them. They know who they are. I, I, you know, Mindings is, is a work in progress, isn't it? You know, I, I, I and what, what I see is the, in you know, the sort of feedback you're getting, the, the comments and overall a sense that people are finding this a really good resource. Yeah, well, it's great. It was, it was one one in particular who her mother has Alzheimer's and she's uh, she's been in touch. She's asked us to do some very specific tweaks um, to the functionality of it, which we've been happy to do, and just specifically for her. And now we're adopting it mm. to the whole system, and uh, it's great because you know I, I built the whole thing specifically for my particular situation with my yeah. with my dad, and uh, now we're opening up to other people. Their situations are different, so we're we're mm. just doing different things with it. So yeah, absolutely, it's. Um, uh, yeah, that's why I really am encouraging a community of people to get involved and tell us what would you like it to do. And, and I think it's also important, you know, that, that it's it, technology has to recognise that everybody has individual needs, hopes, aspirations, and we should be using um, what we know to improve those individual choices rather than saying, you know, here's a sort of blanket product, you, you know, you either adapt it or it's not used, useful for you, we we need to involve people much more in the development of technology. So I think what you're doing with crowdsourcing the development of mindings is um, is a very impressive exemplar, Stu, if I may say. Thank you very much. That's very <laughs> kind. Um, well, all the details of uh, these people that we have mentioned uh, we'll be putting on the website on the notes at disruptorsocialcare.com, and we will also on Friday give them a specific shout out. And uh, also our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash disruptive social care. And you can follow me at Minding Stew. And you can follow me at Shirley Ayres. And if you do tweet about the show, and please do, tell your communities about us. Remember to use the hashtag, hashtag D-E-U-K care. Can, can I just mention, I mean, if, if people see uh, you know, an innovative, innovative um, um, product or service that they would like to bring to our attention if they use the hashtag deuk care then i mean we do monitor the stream and we can pick up on this so if you have any recommendations please do let us know we will check them out and we'll give them a shout out so shirley what do we have coming up in the next few weeks well, I'd, I'd like to just sort of promote a couple of really interesting um, things that are happening. Um, Digital Heroes 2012 is now open for entries and you have the chance to win £10,000 for your digital community project. The, the awards are for organisations, charities or individuals using the internet or digital technology to help people. So it's closing date the 14th of September and I was interested to read that last year's overall winner Chris Dredger works for Storybook Dads and that's a charity that enables parents serving time in British prisons to record themselves reading bedtime stories for their children at home. Absolutely wonderful idea. And, and, and this this encouraging of innovation I, I, I it is just so important for us all. Um, and I I will be contributing to the Social Innovation Camp Meetup, which is exploring startups and social care on the 30th of August at the Google campus. And, you know, it's exploring what is the potential for new startups to get involved in social care and looking at the challenging questions of how we can use technology to help build real-world communities and, and solve some of the most pressing problems that we're we're dealing with, especially um, in connection with an ageing population. Yes, there are a lot of challenges and we'll be looking into those over the next few weeks, uh, over the next podcasts. Um, we've got guests booked in for the next five shows and we have some really good people. Shirley, I'm really excited. Who have we got next week? Well, next week we've got Andrea Sutcliffe and another 
tweeting chief exec. You know, we, we, we are finding them. <laughs> um, and she's the chief exec of the Social Care Institute for Excellence. And she tweets as Crouch and Tiger 7. And um, do let us know if there are questions you would like us to um, discuss with her. Well, uh, you know, so it's likely to be a fairly wide-ranging discussion. <laughs> yeah, so go to our website, Social Care Institute for Excellence, and check it out on Twitter and send us your questions. We'll look forward to chatting with her. Well, that's it from us this week. We hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please help us spread the word. Come visit us at disruptivesocialcare.com and look at our extensive show notes and all the links of the people we've spoken about and the subjects we've discussed and our Facebook page. Come and like us at facebook.com forward slash social care. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.